Will this banking collapse be worse than 2008? Now, unless you've been asleep or dead, you know that the US banking system is collapsing. It's hanging on by a thread with the largest bank collapse since 2008, the second largest ever, and several other banks going down at the same time. The lines at the banks of people pulling their money out around the United States and even Europe forced the Federal Reserve, the US Treasury, the FDIC, and even the US president to come out and take action immediately. But is it too little too late? In this video, we're gonna look at why exactly these banks are collapsing, what magic tricks the Fed just pulled to try to fix things, if this can even be fixed, the great risk you could be under and how to protect yourself and what this all means. If you have money in the bank, which you most likely do, you need to watch this, so let's go. All right, welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Mark Moss, and of course I make these videos to change the way you think about money, because man, money is changing really fast, and if you're paying attention to only what they're showing you, you probably don't understand what's going on. Now, this is gonna be a long video, because this is a very deep subject. If you want the TLDR, right, it's too long, didn't read, um, banks are collapsing, and uh, the government's gonna bail them out, and if you have money in there, you know, it could be at risk. And there, you can get off this video now. That's the short version. However, I'm gonna give you the long version because this is a really big subject and it's changing really rapidly. I've been talking about this coming for months, even years. Here it is, it's finally happening. The largest sovereign debt bubble is bursting. I've been talking about this, it's here, and I'm gonna be making lots more videos because I'm gonna be keeping you up to date on this. Now, I do wanna say, like I said, this is a very fast evolving thing. By the time you watch this, things that might have already changed, and so you'll probably see me updating this regularly once a week. Uh, because it's moving so fast, I've been being called onto other podcasts and shows to talk about it. I am gonna have a live event next week, and we're gonna talk about how this is all evolving and changing, what we're gonna do about it. Uh, I'm gonna do it live because the information is changing so fast. If you wanna find out about that live event next week, there's a link down below, you can check it out. It's gonna be a free event, we'll come hang out, but like I said, I'm doing it live because by the time I record these and get them over to you, the information's changing that fast. And if you're not protected, it could be dangerous. All right, the largest bank failure since 2008 just happened. Now, of course, you've already heard about this, Silicon Valley Bank, or known as SVB, it collapsed, they had $212 billion in assets. And the thing that's crazy is how fast this happened. It failed in about 48 hours. I have 36 hours here. It depends on where you wanna put that timetable. About 48 hours it failed, literally um, just like that. I have uh, a big fund, an investment fund, a VC fund that I advise, had some money there. They got, they got kind of notified something was happening. They opened up an account at another bank. They put the wire transfer in the same day. I mean, who gets a bank account open and wire transfer in the same day? And before the wire could get um, sent out, it closed. That's how fast it happened. And now the bank is in FDIC receivership. But that's kind of the boring part. Why is this bank and other banks failing? And that's what we're gonna take a look at because you need to understand what's going on with the plumbing. All right, now, a lot of people are saying, we gotta bail it out, we gotta bail it out. The Fed has to step in, the government has to step in, we have to give money because contagion. If this doesn't get stopped, it's gonna take out more banks, more banks, more banks, more banks. Yes and no, and I'm gonna explain to you why this is a much bigger problem than one bank going to the next. But so far we had Silvergate Bank. That was really the first big one. The reason why it failed is very similar to why these other ones failed. So Silvergate Bank failed, then Silicon Valley Bank, SVB, which we're talking about right now. Then uh, just this morning we saw Signature Bank was also taken over. We have First Republic Bank that's going down right now. Um, and basically, we have all of the banking stocks were halted today. What does that mean? That means that you can't trade them on the New York Stock Exchange, whatever, because the, they've just stopped them. You can't trade them because they're falling so fast, they don't want all the short sellers piling in and running all these banks into the ground. Yeah, capitalism at its finest. I'm joking. Socialism at its finest. That's the way we do it, uh, but that's exactly what happened. Let's keep going. All right, now part of the problem this is a big problem, so it's going to take a while. But part of the problem is that we had mass influx of deposits. And so in, you know, through the pandemic, the government, the Fed, the Treasury printed trillions of dollars and all that money went into the system. And so the banking deposits grew. They grew from 61 billion in 2019 
to 189 billion at the end of 2021, from 60 to 190 in about two years. So the deposits swelled up at the banks. But what do the banks do with this? Well, they, I mean, they don't have it in paper cash, obviously. They put it into treasuries. They couldn't expand their loan book fast enough. They couldn't, they couldn't invest it fast enough. So what they do? They bought high yielding but risky securities instead. These risky securities, oh yeah, those were US government bonds. All right, this is how bad this is gonna be. We're gonna dig into this in a second. Now, the irony there is that in 2008, the banks collapsed because they made risky investments into these mortgage-backed securities that were securitized, uh, kind of packaged up. They couldn't understand what the risk was. This time they're going broke because they bought government bonds. And we have this guy, good old Jerome Powell, to thank for this. He's bankrupt now the U.S. He's bankrupt the Fed. He's now bankrupt the U.S. Treasury. We talked about that in a video a few weeks ago. Maybe we can link that up here. We'll put it down in the description as well. Bankrupt the Treasury. Now he's bankrupting the banking sector. Uh, because he went on the fastest and the largest Fed hike rate increase that we've seen since 1994 with reckless abandon, just raking, raising the rates. And we all have been saying, look, they're going to do this until something breaks. Well, something broke. <laughs> the Fed's broke, Treasury's broke, and now the banks are broke. Something's broke. And basically what happened is the investments that had high interest rates got completely hammered. And it was the long-term U.S. Treasuries and the mortgage-backed securities got completely wrecked. And the reason why, <clears throat> we can see the interest rate hikes here. So basically zero, uh, this is uh, 2008. So in 2008, they had to lower the rates. Rates stayed at zero. They started uh, cranking back up to about 2019. Then the pandemic came, had to drop them back down, stayed flat. And now look at how steep and fast that is. I always like to show you the charts so you can see that. Uh, but what happened is, as they raised rates, the bonds sold off. Look at that. Look how fast those bonds sell off because they work in inverse. As the rates go up, the value of the bond goes down. So they go like this, all right? So as he raised those rates with reckless abandon, all those bonds became worth less, worth less. And so these banks who had all this money from 60 billion to 189 billion, they put it into treasuries and then the treasuries got worth less because the Fed went uh, rate hiking with reckless abandon. All right, that's the simple version. It gets a little bit deeper. Now, you have to understand with SVP specifically, they had huge security portfolios, 120 billion a portfolio in long dated US treasuries. They also had a bunch of mortgage backed securities. They had way too many, uh, well, when we say too many, uh, much higher, almost double the percentage of their, per of their portfolio in mortgage backed securities than what you would normally see. So they're taking abnormal amounts of risk, all right? So the other thing that they had is that because they were in these treasuries, the long dated treasuries and the mortgage backed securities, every 1% rise in the Fed raising rates, SVP was losing five and a half billion dollars. Rates rose 450 basis points in 2022, last year. So SVP had $25 billion in unrealized losses. Now, I say unrealized because those bonds don't get marked to market every day. The value is going down. It's an unrealized loss, but they haven't sold it yet. Remember, you know, you, you don't lose until you sell. You also don't make until you sell either. Uh, so they hadn't realized those losses yet, yet. But the problem was at some point, people might actually want to get their money out. We're going to get to that in a second, but what they did you know, hedge funds are called hedge funds because they hedge their risk. Banks should also hedge their risk. If you run a business and you have money in the bank savings, you need to be managing that and you have to hedge your risk with that. And they didn't do that. They had 91 billion of US treasuries and mortgage backed securities and they had no hedges. What you do when you have large amounts of money is you offset or you hedge that interest rate risk because different treasuries are, have different maturities and they have different interest rates. They had no hedges. They had no swaps. They had no swapped options, nothing. It was complete lack of all risk management. And so the reason why I wasn't really for a bank bailout is because it was gross negligence. It was um, potentially fraudulent at some point. They had zero risk management at all and that's what caused them to fail. Now, what about the poor depositors? Well, I mean, maybe they should have looked at 
the, who is running the bank and if they had proper risk management, how do you do that? Uh, it could be difficult, so maybe you should manage your risk a little bit better, such as breaking your money into smaller accounts, different banks, things like that, bigger banks. And we're gonna talk about small banks and big banks in a second. All right, but the problem that really put this into a tailspin, because remember, they lost all that money on treasuries, but it was unrealized losses until deposits uh, started drying up. So what happened is, of course, because the Fed is raising rates so fast, he's trying to crush demand, so asset prices are plunging down. As that started happening, this was Silicon Valley Bank. So these are all the big tech startups in Silicon Valley. They have lots of money in the bank, but the tech sector is the one that's gotten completely hammered. So they've been pulling lots of money out. They need that money to keep paying the bills, but they haven't get, been getting more money in. So like a Ponzi, <laughs> the bank, sort of like a Ponzi, was not getting enough money in to cover the deposits going out. The tech firms, the VCs started removing their deposits pulling more money out there, putting in. And the other problem, this is really big, and this is something I'm gonna advise you on, we'll talk about this towards the end, but there's a flight to attractive 5% short-term T-bills. So your bank is paying you 0% interest to keep your money in the bank. But the government will give you 5% to put it into T-bills directly. So a lot of people are doing that. The banks aren't offering to you, all move to treasuries, I'm doing that, and so between them spending more than they're receiving back in, and people are just taking their money out, putting it into Bitcoin, putting it into gold, putting it directly into treasuries, the banks are losing lots of money. So they were facing way more outflows of deposits than they were receiving in. The Ponzi was drying up. And what this did is it caused a bank run. It caused a bank run. People wanted their money. On Tuesday, SVP announced that they had sold to 21 billion of their available for sale securities and lost two billion dollars. So people wanted their money from the bank, SVB didn't have it in cash, they were forced to sell their treasuries, which remember were an unrealized loss, but because they were forced to sell them to pay the depositors, <laughs> the losses became realized almost $2 billion. So what are they gonna do? Well, we gotta pay the people. So they announced that they were going to go raise money. We're gonna go raise two and a quarter billion to offset this $1.8 billion loss that we have. But then nobody wanted to loan them money. Why would they? They were insolvent. They didn't wanna do that. Surprise, surprise, investors didn't wanna do that. Peter Thiel put out a, a, a message that, hey, all the portfolio companies that I manage, everyone should get their money out of the bank. And once people started hearing that I should get my money out of the bank, then you wanna be the first one to get your money out of the bank, not the last one, as they found out the hard way. All right, this is what happened. Now, this is what happened in Silvergate. This is what happened in all the banks. They all had their money in long-term treasuries. They all lost money because the Fed raised the rates so high. And as soon as investors go, shoot, I should probably get my money out before I lose it, it creates a run on the bank. They don't have it. Now, this is a new phenomenon. It's not a new phenomenon. We've had a run on banks since, uh, since before the Federal Reserve, since the free banking era. But we're in a new paradigm now. We're in something called the digital age. And in the digital age, things move really, really fast. What kind of things move fast? Well, it spreads like wildfire thanks to something called social media. All right, so in the past, you know, in the 1930s or in the 1800s when we had runs on the bank, you know, you might hear about it, you know, very, very slowly, then you go to the bank, stand in line and get your cash out. But today we have something called social media. So as soon as somebody posts about it, especially something like losing your money, it spreads like wildfire. Everybody hears that. But even more importantly, we're also in the, in the digital age. We're in the uh, digital age of banking. And so in the old days, the 1930s, the 1800s, maybe I hear about it, maybe I don't. M maybe I can get to a bank, maybe I can't. I have to stand in line at the bank and then I have to try to pull up my money. But in the digital age, all I gotta do is see a post on Twitter, open up my app, my banking app, and do a wire transfer and transfer the money right out of that bank into another bank. I can transfer that money right out of the bank into Bitcoin, into gold, whatever I wanna do, instantly. I can see the message, I can transfer the money out instantly. They can't handle that. The banks aren't equipped for that because they do something called, well, it used to be fractional reserve banking, meaning they only had a fraction of the reserves in the bank. Now there's no reserve banking, so they, have, they don't have the reserves. So if 1% of the people wanna go pull their money out of the bank, they don't have it. They don't have it. We can see that total deposit call of 42 billion on Wednesday 
was roughly a quarter of its 173 billion deposit base. They didn't have the money. So then it went into FDIC receivership. So now the FDIC is gonna to have to sort this out. Now, what they announced this morning as of uh, this week is that the Fed is going to make all the depositors whole, whether they had FDIC insurance or not. So the depositors are gonna be okay. The bank is gonna go under. Now, what does this mean? We're gonna break that down in a second. Okay, now like I was saying, this is all the banks. Now this isn't just the banks that went under, this is all the banks. This is the entire banking sector. It's even bigger than the banking sector, I'm gonna show you that. But basically, all banks are underwater. Post great financial crash, since 2008, post great financial crash, they have this very high these reserve requirements to hold US treasuries. We require US treasuries uh, for the banks to hold them and they've had their worst year ever. 2022 saw the worst year for stocks and bonds in over 50 years. So post GFC, we forced the banks to hold all these and then they did horrible, thanks to the Fed raising rates with reckless abandon. We saw 650 billion in unrealized losses within the banking sector. 650 billion lost because of the Fed raising rates. $210 billion was lost at the big four banks alone. And this is a complete FDIC nightmare that they never want to think about it because they have, the FDIC has only 128 billion in reserves. Now I did a video talking about this and, and giving you sound clips and video of what the FDIC meeting actually said. Maybe we can link that FDIC video up here. We'll put it in the notes down below as well. But we can see these unrealized losses right here, how bad they are. To put it a different way, here's the big four banks right here. The big four are uh, Bank of America, JP Morgan, Citibank, and Wells Fargo. And look how much money they've been losing right here thanks to the Fed with reckless abandon that was gonna to continue to raise rates until something broke. And here we are. Now we can see um, this is uh, small bank reserves right here. But look how far these small bank reserves have gone. So if you have your money at a small bank, there's a good chance it could have a big problem. If you're gonna watch this video, you're probably gonna go get your money out of that small bank, which is gonna cause an even bigger problem for them <laughs> and it's, it's a downward spiral. Now, this isn't just small banks, these are the large bank reserves, so we can see how far they've fallen off as well. Big banks have fallen off, small banks are off of a cliff, almost down, I mean, that's zero right there, all right? This is a really big deal. And as I said, the FDIC insurance, while their balance has been growing to 128 billion, they have a fraction. They have like one out of uh, every $17 they're supposed to have reserved. And if you think this is just the small banks or just the big banks, let me show you this chart. This is the Fed. The Fed that's supposed to backstop all the banks. So you think it's bad for small banks, big banks. What about the Fed's backstop? This is the amount of money that they make that they submit to the treasury. So they have to give the treasury any profit that they make. And look at that. <laughs> it, it actually goes off the chart right there. So this is not small banks, it's not about big banks, this is all the banks, and this is the Fed as well. That's how big this is gonna be. All right, now, banking activity has basically ground to a halt until something breaks, here we are. Over 30 bank stocks were halted, like I said, in trading. You can't even trade them anymore because they've been plummeting so fast. Bank reserves are dangerously low for some of the small banks, they're almost to zero. All right, because the Fed's been tightening, trying to take the money out of the system. It's worked, congratulations. Interbank lending, which happens back and forth between banks, uh, has completely frozen up, All right? That's a big problem. We can see the amount of reserves here, small banks to big banks. Either way, they're both very low. The interbank funding, I just wanna show you the chart so you can see how fast this has risen. It was going down, 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 and then look at that. <laughs> Whoa, put this into perspective, here's the pandemic. We're basically in the same level, right? We're basically in the same place. And as I said, you can just see here's from the Bloomberg terminal. This is a list of all the bank stocks that were just completely traded. Uh, I'm sorry, halting trading. They don't want you trading that. Now, it's not game over yet because the Fed's like a magician. They continually can pull new tricks out of their hat. 
And this is why economists that I respect, like Harry Dent, uh, his analysis is amazing and it's, and it's factually correct, but what he's been wrong about, sorry Harry, is that he hasn't been able to see all the tricks that the Fed has, a, has up their sleeve. All right? This is why I know what's inevitable, I know what's coming, timing is very difficult. All right, the Fed basically opened up its direct lending facility um, to help the banks. Now, will this work? Let's take a look. What we do know is that they have opened this up. Here it says Federal Reserve announces emergency lending facility to shore up the banks. But how does the Fed that's insolvent shore up banks that are insolvent? It's gonna be interesting. We're gonna take a look at that. But let me show you what this is. So basically, per the Federal Reserve's own website, right here at the press release, through the creation of a new bank term funding program, that's what they call it, bank term funding program, a BTFD, uh, they offered loans up to one year in length to banks. And so basically what they're doing is these assets will be valued at par. So they said, hey, the Fed said, hey banks, uh, you know, we forced you to buy all these treasuries. And so uh, we know that it's not worth as much as you paid for it because we rec raised with reckless abandon. So here's what we're gonna do. We're going to take those as collateral and give you the full amount of payment. So you bought it at a dollar, it's only worth 80 cents today. No worries, we're gonna give you the dollar. All right, so we're gonna give it back to you at par what you paid for it. Here's the problem. One, <laughs> there's insolvent, but most importantly, it's only for up to a year. So what happens after the year? Is this gonna magically go away? Well, maybe it might if they go back into a massive easing money printing program and drive the value of those bonds back up, maybe. Maybe they could roll it over. We don't know how many magic tricks they have up their sleeve, but basically it's a bailout, all right? It's a bailout, that's what they're doing. And it's easing. This is monetary easing that's happening. 650 billion in unrealized losses. Uh, the banks can basically just erase their losses. This is like a blank check. So this is massive easing. And if you don't know what I mean by easing, I mean it's money printing. Money printer go burr. That's what basically I'm talking about. New money is being created uh, if the banks want it, right? making them par, making them whole. It saves the banks by letting them start a square one, starting back at square one which means there's no lessons learned. That's the thing with capitalism. Capitalism is, hey, you make a risky bet, you lose your money. Next time you don't make that risky bet again. But every time we bail these people out, no lessons get learned, which makes them only become a worse offender over and over and over. It pushes more money into money creation, credit creation, driving inflation onto everyone else. The Fed's gonna make all these banks whole, all these depositors whole. It's good for those depositors, Silicon Valley, all those big rich people in Silicon Valley, it's good for them. But you and I, we have to suffer from inflation. That means higher prices, that means your dollars don't buy you as many things. And basically what it does is it kicks the can down the road. Now, this isn't just bad for you and I suffering from inflation. This is bad from a lot of reasons. This is now the credit worthiness of the United States government. What we can see here is the United States government, historical range of credit worthiness used to be about here and now it's all the way down here, which makes it worse than almost all these other countries. The United States government, the full faith and credit of the United States government certainly isn't what it used to be. And this money printer go burr has lit up financial assets. Now, these are all banks that are red down here. The banks are going down because they're all broke. But all the other assets are going through the roof because again, that's money printer going burr. I've been telling you it's coming. There's no other way around it. All right. Now the markets see this, the markets see easing. So the Fed's been on this war path, raising rates. When will they pivot? When will they pivot? I've been talking about this a lot. Well, it looks like they're basically saying the Fed funds futures, so people bet on this and we can see where this is at. They said they're, pr they're pricing either no more rate hikes or maybe one more. That's what the market's saying right now. And they're saying there's an 87% chance that will be back 87.6, almost 88% chance that will be easing again this year, 2023. 
all right? So that's what the betting markets are telling us, that no more, maybe one more or no more rate hikes, and we'll be back to printing, easing money by the end of the year. Of course, we're already printing. We're already easing money. You can see it all in this chart right here. This, this kind of tells you everything. This is a list of all the bank stocks that have been halted. Can't trade them anymore. And this is all the cryptocurrencies that are going through the roof. They're all green. Bitcoin's up 20%, Ethereum's up 15%, etc. cetera. Bank stocks down, cryptocurrency up. People realize I better put my money into something else. Of course, you can see Bitcoin surging like that. I, I'm, I'm reminded of this quote here. I use it quite often. Ludwig von Mises, the father of the Austrian School of Economics, he calls it the crack up boom. And then he says, and then suddenly, all right? People still believe that prices one day will drop. The Fed's tightening, they're pulling away the liquidity, everything's gonna crash, right? People believe the prices one day will drop. So they're waiting for this day. And what they do is they restrict their purchases, they're saving cash, they increase their cash holding. People think the prices are gonna drop. House prices are coming down, Bitcoin's coming down to $10,000, everything's coming down, I'm gonna hold my cash. But then, finally, the masses wake up. They become suddenly aware of the fact that inflation is both deliberate policy and will go on endlessly. So, would you say that inflation is both deliberate and will go on endlessly? Okay, then finally, everybody is anxious to swap their money against real goods, no matter whether they need them or not. So, that's what we're seeing. We're seeing gold through the roof today. We've seen Bitcoin through the roof today because I can go on social media, see that, I can go into my bank, do a wire transfer, and I can buy Bitcoin, smash buy it. I can buy gold, and that's what people are doing. You have no counterparty risk if you hold that Bitcoin in your cold storage, and of course, it's the most scarce asset in the world. Now that's what's happening. Now, there's a whole lot more to this. I am gonna be updating this because this is moving really, really fast. We are watching this all fall down. We saw the SEC chair, Gary Gensler, um, put out a thing this morning saying that he's gonna potentially be prosecuting people who are putting this information out and causing markets to fall even further. I'm not gonna be silenced. I'm gonna tell you what's gonna happen. I'm gonna try to protect your money as best I can and show you how to navigate this. So I'll be updating this, probably be doing one video a week, depending on how fast this is going. Of course, like I said, next week, I'm gonna be doing a live event so we can do live Q&A, show you what I'm doing about this. Um, if you wanna join me, there's a link down below. Let me know what you think. I know this is scary, but we're gonna get through it together, okay? We're gonna get through it together. Um, like always, leave me a thumbs up if you like this video. If you don't, you can give me a thumbs down, that's okay, but at least leave me a comment, tell me why. That's what I got, all right? To your success, I'm out.